Oh, I wish I had a song. Uh, it, it does occur to me that um, it's good to remember that some things have changed over the years. So uh, for a moment, looking back over time, I remember that when I was born, the majority of Americans did not drop into high school. I just, I think it's well to remember that we're engaged in a relatively novel experiment. And I think we've uh, tried, are playing within many wrong ways. But I think it's worth remembering that uh, I am old, but I'm not ancient. <laughs> so we're talking about modern times and the changes in what we are asking of schools and what we have a right to assume is necessary if the kind of democratic life that uh, we want to nourish and expand is going to survive. The, the idea that the controlling purpose of the public incarceration of its young for in the beginning six or eight years, then 10 or 12 years, and now 12, 14, 16 years needs some justification. At very least, the kids have to know why, although they committed, as far as they know, no crime, we are, in a sense, locking them up for five, six, seven hours a day during the most lively, imaginative, healthy years of their lives. And uh, like most of the conference goers here, they do comply. They generally do come to school. But like us, they are mostly interested in the breaks. Uh, that's where they hang out. That's where they find their friends. Uh, they can discuss who will eat lunch with whom, what are you going to do when school is over. Uh, and in between these breaks, they go into these rooms and then rush out as soon as they can. And at the end of the day, as we've often noted, they, if you ever stand outside of school, they leap out of school full of energy for the real world. And following them about a half an hour, an hour later, the staff droops out, <laughs> exhausted. And uh, wouldn't it be nice, I think, if the kids would leave exhausted and we would leap out <laughs> full of energy. Or at least there was something closer. So uh, I have two points I want to make uh, about our insanity. Uh, one is uh, about how hard it is to develop democratic habits. I, I, I'm not going to give a speech about it because it's a long speech, but I want to argue that habits are what a democracy needs. And habits are the hardest thing to come by. They can't be taught like this. And uh, as I sometimes say, where's my purse? Um, I, I uh, have a habit. No, I don't have a habit. I know exactly where I'm supposed to put my cell phone and my keys in my purse. I have a zipper compartment for one and a, another kind of compartment for the other. And that's where they're supposed to be. I could pass a standardized test on where my keys <laughs> and cell phone are supposed to be. The trouble is they're very often not there. <laughs> Especially in times of stress, which is when it's most important that they be there. <laughs> well, that's how we've treated democracy in this country. At best, we call, have a course called Democracy or Civics 101. And uh, then in times of stress, very few of, of our fellow Americans, including ourselves, can remember what is habeas corpus anyway? And why should we worry about that, about people we don't like? <laughs> and almost any time we get rushed in our schools or any place else, we think, well, it would be nice to decide this democratically. But we really, uh, because it's so important and we don't have a lot of time, we can't do it. That's our natural way of operating. Democracy has never been deep down, and I'm talking about myself too. Uh, you know, as the principal of school, if there are times I fudge on our democracy and it's precisely at the moments when it's most important, not least important, uh, because the habits of democracy are not intuitive, we're not born with them, it, they're as counterintuitive as modern physics, and they need many years of practice. So I want you to keep that over here. And then the other is, where do you get, where would you practice them? And it seems to me you have to practice them in the company of people who are exhibiting them. That is a dilemma. I mean, that's 
always been one of the great dilemmas about human change is how do you get this generation to do what the generation that's teaching them how to do it differently isn't doing it themselves? Uh, how do you leap over the present into the future? And uh, well, I, I don't actually think there's any way to do it. Uh, the generation us have to change some of our habits if the generation to come is going to develop different habits. And we have this incarceration period to play with how we would do that. Uh, and I'm reminded in this respect to uh, another little anecdote about my brother and I, some of you have heard this, my brother and I going to play, watch the New York Yankees throughout our childhood. We were both fanatical fans. And we went together a lot. I had the job of keeping score, and I knew how to do that. And he had the job of watching the game so he could be a better ball player. Because his idea was to become Mickey Mantle. And he watched the game as Mickey Mantle. He played a few other people, too. I can't remember all their names. But um, you know, when, when the pitcher and catcher were there, he was either the pitcher or the catcher or the batter. He would focus on different people. His whole body was involved in the game. And I was spending my time thinking about how I might marry Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> so it depended on who we imagined we could be and who we imagined we wanted to be. And uh, you don't learn how to play baseball well if you're thinking about how to marry Joe DiMaggio. He isn't planning to marry a fellow ball player. Uh, you, think about other things. So that notion that the company we keep has to include people we would like to become and could imagine we could be, and who we develop, we uh, and incorporate their habits almost by nature. You know people who, when you listen to them talk, you know who their mentor is. They've got some of the hand movements. They have some of the body style. Uh, they haven't done that by taking a class on it. It's because they have tried to imagine themselves into the roles of others. And certainly almost no kids have ever experienced in school an opportunity to watch an adult community that practices the habits of democracy and who learn from their habits what it might be to be a powerful member of a powerful community. And I heard some kids talking, just reminded me so much on a radio show that was entitled, uh, oh, they were, these were dropouts, and they were asked the question, uh, did they ever know anybody who graduated college? And the dropouts, one after the other, said no. And I'm sitting there thinking, why doesn't he pursue the question? Because they all went to school. They dropped out, but they went to school for eight, 10 years. They all had teachers. All those teachers had college degrees. What do they mean they didn't know any adults with college degrees? And then I thought, of course, the word no. They didn't. They didn't know any of the teachers they'd had. Maybe they knew the kindergarten teacher a little bit. Uh, but since then, they probably didn't know any of the teachers they had and didn't know them in a way that I'm talking about. They weren't in keeping company with those teachers in a community of adults that included their families their teachers, and themselves. And uh, until, if we had sat around and tried to design schools, individual schools and a school system, least likely to enable kids to learn the habits of adulthood from adults, and that those habits had ones that we cherished and believed essential to a democratic life, we would have created the school system we now have. It's almost impossible, I think sometimes, about how long the passing period is in high schools, even good ones. Where is the time for that interchange, of watching teachers casually com conversing with them, imagining them as, imagining yourself as an intern in their world, a novice at being an adult. And we have organized from start to finish so that teachers don't get a chance to look at each other that way. Novice teachers aren't learning from expert teachers. Novice kids aren't learning from expert kids. In fact, we're kind of afraid to have little kids in the presence of older kids. Parents and teachers alike, if I tell them our building has 
an elementary school and a high school's first reaction is, oh dear, is that safe? Instead of looking at our older kids as the source of safety for young kids, and if that doesn't make sense to us, said there's something terribly wrong here, that little kids have first to be afraid of older kids, who should in fact be the ones they look to as who they will be. And we have walled them off from each other. We put all the five-year-olds here, all the six-year-olds here, all the seven-year-olds there. And by the time they get about 10, we put them in another building as far away as possible with different entry and exit time, so they're not likely to bump into each other. There's a statement underneath there that we need to rethink. And uh, as Nancy Sizer reminded me, uh, there's a way in which we have organized society, and probably the first human society in the world that ever had this idea, that the closer young people get to being grown-ups, the fewer grown-ups they should keep company with. That's, no matter what our values were, that's insane. And for creating a democratic society, it just plain won't work. And the constraints that keep us often from challenging that in our position as teachers and principals. Uh, uh, she's my timekeeper. Um, uh, are real and powerful. And I don't for one moment think, however, that uh, in the meantime, until we get those constraints changed and those policies changed, we should ever say to ourselves, well, that's the way it is. I can't, what can I do about it? Because my school runs this way. Uh, my old mentor, Lillian Weber, said there is always a little crack somewhere that you can widen. And as we wait to widen the cracks in the larger society, we have to keep widening the cracks where we are. Thank you.